but that's just the word is the free man. I mean, what it is is it's a self-generated, self-controlled immersion in a non-causal, parallel um, construct of some sort. And the reason shamans live in isolation and on the periphery of modern and high-density urban civilization is essentially so that they can build these castles in the air that they inhabit. They build unique mythological structures that are like accretions of their very powerful personalities. That's what all this storytelling is about. It's these stories are are the contextual define the contextual limits of what is possible and if you live in a culture where night after night year after year you've grown up around the fire hearing the most respected people in the group tell these outlandish stories then for you it legitimizes the search for a doorway out of mundane experience and that's really the, the only precondition for finding such a doorway. I mean, if you love the weird and you probe it often enough, deeply enough, eventually you'll hit the jackpot. The, you know, and the door will swing open. And I watched it definitely uh, very effective for, for doing that. Yeah. Uh, I guess the Icaros really generate a lot of visions. The song sung and some of those are available on cassette. Do you think if that kind of visionary generation would come through on a cassette? If you if you did an ayahuasca analog and well, if you listen, yeah, I mean, if you listen to music on ayahuasca, it is a trans it transforms the music. You have to be very careful. I had an I recall many years ago it was the night of a of a total eclipse or some hellish thing in the sky, a total eclipse of some kind. And Sunwater and Adele, who some of you may know, and I decided that we would do the ayahuasca that I'd had in the back of the refrigerator for years. And this was like a long time ago, maybe eight years ago, and I got it out and I couldn't remember whether Don Fidel had said always shake the bottle or never <laughs> shake the bottle <laughs> before you so I said well to be safe we should shake the bottle in, in case that's what he did say so I did and and uh, you know it, I've never had it hit me so hard and we were I had put on a record which I had previously found mildly entertaining and the goal of the first 40 minutes of this ayahuasca trip became to survive the playing of this record. I mean, it was so, uh, I don't know. I've had other experiences. A friend of mine brought me a tape uh, from tribal Afghanistan that I listened to one night in Hawaii on ayahuasca, and I became so alarmed and freaked out and I just I could hear something in this music that just shouldn't have been there I could hear that you know this wasn't wizened ragheads in mud huts somewhere that these guys had connections into the Martian musicians union and the highly agitating so I think the ayahuasca songs are probably tailored to create a certain aura of confidence and they're reassuring. It's nice to sit with these old guys and, and and watch them make beautiful music. And when you're alone, you can sing too. I mean, it's very important to sing, especially if you become afraid or alarmed. This is the key. If you get into deep water with these substances, this is true of psilocybin as well, you don't want to clench. You don't want to assume the fetal position and stop breathing and and you want to sit up straight and breathe and sing and sing it back and it, it will step back it will you know you can take control of your situation most of the time <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask about the, about the parallel universe American Indian storytelling and mythology has a great deal to say about these things and their adventure myths about the two young guys that go out and meet the two chicks and then disappear for 12 years. And, you know, this is a common in, in 
enduring being, but it's my thinking of this decision that, that this kind of stuff does exist, and I could have expounded a little bit about when you get into that place, what level of verity do you find yourself giving it? Well, I, I'm very, very careful. I mean, like, the way I do these things normally is alone, Mm-hmm. and I unplug the telephone and I don't tell anybody I'm going to do it and I do it in darkness and I roll joints in front of me so I don't even have to move and basically <laughs> once it gets going I don't do anything because I'm so aware of how involved in it is. I mean I don't I think you have to be almost a damn fool to just grab hold of this stuff and start flailing it around. I mean, for me, it's like I creep up to the abyss and hang my head over it and look, and then I edge back to <laughs> The idea of trying to actually do something is terrifying because it'll work. I mean, you can do it, but, but you don't understand what you're doing. So I'm, I like to look. They cure. But the main thing, I mean, I think the getting information thing is sort of overstressed because it's astonishing and it proves that it's a higher dimension. I mean, if somebody really can see who stole the chicken, and they really can see then even though it's a trivial matter about a chicken, not, there's nothing trivial about the fact that they are exhibiting a paranormal ability which seems to involve the contradiction of cause and effect. How can they see who stole the chicken? Number one, the chicken has already been stolen by the time the question is asked of the shaman. Well, so then does the shaman travel back in time? Does the shaman read the minds of everyone in the tribe and, and look and find who stole the chicken that way? Or is it just an inspired guess backed up by social pressure? Uh, what exactly is going on here? And then when you turn toward the future, it becomes even more mysterious because many of these shamanic things are about uh, deciding where the hunting will take place and saying, you know, if we go to the second waterfall, then there will be Kapibari to be killed. And then they go and there is and they do. Well, if you believe that this person actually saw the future, then you're coming perilously close to some kind of determinism, which is, you know, not supportable philosophically. I mean, if the universe is absolutely determined, then thinking has no meaning. Because if the universe is determined, then you think what you think because you couldn't think anything else. So thinking suddenly is divorced from the enterprise of knowing reality. And that's a little discouraging to those of us who butter our bread in the fields of philosophy. So I think it's, you know, it's very mysterious. The model that I use for all of these psychedelics is a mathematical model, not a psychological model or a spiritual model, but a mathematical model. Mine, under the pressure of evolution, under the pressure of the need to defend self and offspring, has folded itself down into the three-dimensional space-time matrix of the body. Mind has sort of, has crippled itself in order to caretake the body and the here and now. Well, when you take these psychedelics, it's like it's severed. The mind is severed from the physical envelope. And you wander in a much 